here. All right, Acts chapter 15 this morning, church, is where we'll be together this morning. And I want to let you know that I am trying to preach shorter. It's not working out. <laughs> it's not working out. But I was encouraged because... And I just want to say this, that if any of you tuned in to either Fox News' or CNN's wall-to-wall coverage of 23 hours of some convention last week, and if you heard the keynote speaker went 92 minutes, I feel like the Word of God's a little more important than that. And so, uh, uh, of course, I'm having a little bit of fun at the expense of politics. Uh, but uh, I've not named names or anything like that, but it was a very long speech uh, and many people fell asleep. So I think we can identify with that, right? We can identify with what it means to fall asleep during a lecture. Uh, but this is a very important passage, kind of a, a, a very um, optimal moment for the early church here that we are still reaping benefits of today and still fighting the fight about today. Uh, so uh, Acts 15 is where we'll be reading verses 1 through 13. We'll just uh, kind of introduce the, uh, the agenda of the chapter today and uh, talk about a few key points. The Bible says in Acts chapter 15, verse number 1, that uh, certain men which came down from Judea taught the brethren and said, except ye be circumcised after the manner of Moses, ye cannot be saved. Uh, when therefore Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and disputation with them, they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain other of them should go up to Jerusalem unto the apostles and elders about this question. Uh, the message is going to be about that question, which we'll explain in a moment. And being brought on their way uh, by the church, they passed through Phoenice and Samaria, declaring the conversion of the Gentiles, and they caused great joy unto all the brethren. And when they were come to Jerusalem, they were received of the church and of the apostles and elders, and they declared all things that God had done with them. But there rose up certain of the sect of the Pharisees, which believed, saying that it was needful to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. And the apostles and elders came together for to consider of this matter. And when there had been much disputing, Peter rose up, said unto them, Men and brethren, ye know how that a good while ago God made choice among us, that the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God, which uh, knoweth the hearts, bear them witness, giving them the Holy Ghost, even as he did unto us, and put no difference between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. Now therefore, why tempt ye God to put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? But we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved even as they. That's a powerful statement. Then all the multitude kept silence and gave audience to Barnabas and Paul, declaring what miracles and wonders God had wrought among the Gentiles by them. And after they had held their peace, James answered, saying, Men and brethren, hearken unto me. And that just kind of gets us uh, our appetites wet for next week, and we'll look at that, that uh, statement by James. But we have enough to talk about this morning. Here's the message titled this morning, The First Reformation. The First Reformation. I'd like to pray once more. Father, I ask that you would uh, work in hearts and work in minds. I pray that I'll be able to make uh, this, uh, the importance of these concepts understandable today. I uh, ask that you would uh, Give us your spirit, as the, the, this passage clearly states, is given to everyone that believes on the Lord Jesus Christ, whether Jew or Gentile. Thank you for uh, putting no difference between us and them. Thank you for opening the way by the cross and the blood of Jesus Christ. I pray that uh, someone today will understand the simplicity of salvation by grace through faith. And we thank you for the word of God and ask that it would be uh, clearly understood today with the illuminating power of your Holy Spirit. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Pick this up. Just leave it all on. All right. um, and, and one of the microphones is going to pick me up. On October 31st, 1517, a monk named Martin Luther uh, nailed his 95 theses to the door of the castle church in Wittenberg, Germany. He was challenging, by doing that, he was challenging the practices of 
uh, of the uh, state church, uh, that of selling forgiveness, selling indulgences. He was challenging the infallibility of the Pope, and most importantly, the definition of salvation by faith alone. Uh, there have been others before Luther who had tried to fight against these practices, to fight against these false doctrines, and, and they had questioned the church, and they had lost their lives because of it. There's great personal cost, but this time it was different. It was different because Luther was an inside man. Luther was an inside uh, clergyman who was, uh, who was saying that the, that the Bible definition of salvation was something very different from how the church at the time, the state church, was, was defining salvation. The, the, the church was saying, you might be a Christian. You might be a Christian if you, if you, if you uh, buy all these indulgences, if you confess your sins to the priest, if you go to Mass, and Martin Luther was leading this movement, leading this Reformation. He was coming up with a totally different definition based on Scripture. So in 1517, the rumblings of the Reformation began. The following year, heated debates were held in Augsburg, Germany, and the lines were clearly being drawn. It was in Augsburg where the battle cry of the Reformation, sola scriptura, or the Scriptures alone, as the final authority. The scriptures alone are being infallible and without error. It was, it was there in Augsburg where the battle cry of the Reformation, sola scriptura, was forged. I hope you understand that the issues at stake in those meetings were not trivial. They, they, they were not petty. They did not gather in 1518 or so to debate the color of carpeting in a church. Or, or to, to finally settle once and for all which side of the auditorium up in front the piano should go on. They were not talking about music standards or dress standards or whether the pastor should wear a tie or, or not wear a tie or, or anything like that. They were literally debating and risking their lives for the definition of salvation. What does the Bible say? They were risking their lives to, to hammer out, well, who has authority in the church? Church councils, church leaders, or the Word of God? They were hammering through all these things. They were dealing with this matter of selling indulgences and how to purchase forgiveness of sins for yourself and for your family. And, and ultimately this, church, listen, what is it that would give people entrance into heaven in eternity? Now, it's important to fight about the right things. There are Christians who fight about absolutely everything, and that's not right. And there are Christians who fight over absolutely nothing. They fight for absolutely nothing. They, they never get upset about anything going on, and that's not right either. Beloved, there are theological issues that are worth fighting for. I'll say it again, there are theological, scriptural issues that are worth fighting for. Martin Luther, <laughs> I'll say it again, he was not there in this Reformation. They were not fighting for life group philosophy or, or uh, the, the formatting of the bulletin or anything like that. He was calling out the religious crowd and he was saying, uh, uh, the battle lines are drawn, and, and my friends, listen, there's, there's, there always has been and there always will be division and disagreement over how a person is saved. The default of the human condition is to want to earn salvation. We, we default as humans to a, a works-based righteousness. And, and that's what this Reformation is all about. There, there's always going to be, there always has been disagreement over how a person is saved and how a person becomes a Christian. Is it going to be sola scriptura, the, the scriptures alone, or are we going to throw tradition? Are we going to throw uh, works and, and law in there. We should always go to battle when the purity of the gospel is at stake. That's a battle we should always be willing to stand up and fight. So the core of this issue is this. What does the Bible say? 
Can I just encourage you to go back to that as convoluted as our culture gets, as confusing as, as some of our decisions that we face in this world get? Go back. What does the Bible say? In fact, um, I, was, I left some of these things out of my notes uh, and out of the message, but I, I do remember that I was reading about kind of tracking how the Catholic Church, and I, I'm sorry to name names, but I'm, I'm also not sorry, how the Catholic Church down through the years has continually elevated the status of Mary. Finally, in the 90s or so, elevating her to the status of co redeemer in the act of salvation. And, and the Newsweek article in 1991 cites uh, this story and the, the, it, it uh, gives the history of these decisions the Catholic Church has made. Uh, and it says, Newsweek says this, a secular magazine, a very secular uh, liberal left-leaning magazine says, this position seems to find strong disagreement in the New Testament scriptures. Even Newsweek understood that Mary in scriptures is not seen as a co-redeemer in the work of salvation. So this is the core issue. This is the singular issue that should settle most of our debates. What does the Bible say? And that question, by the way, has raged in councils and in the writings of theologians and the early church fathers since the church began. In fact, what we see today is that the very first Reformation began just about 20 years or so after Jesus Christ ascended to heaven. The first Reformation, the first battle lines being drawn over the definition of salvation right here, just 20 years or so after Christ ascended to the Father. The church reached a boiling point over this question, what does a Christian look like? What does a Christian, what does a person have to do to be saved? And Acts 15 gives us the very important historical account. Notice number one this morning, the allegations, verses one through five. The allegations. <clears throat> it was, let me, I gotta paint a picture for you. It, it was very hard for some of the Jewish Christians to accept the fact that these Gentiles could be brought into the church and be brought into the church with equal footing, equal standing in the eyes of God without first coming through the law of Moses and the right of circumcision. It was very hard for them to understand. You, you, you have to understand, maybe put yourself in Jewish shoes as much as we can today and, and imagine that you have kept the law strictly your whole life. You have spent your whole life worried about the law. You have kept it scrupulously. You have kept it carefully all 613 of them. You, you have given great attention and all of a sudden come along these Johnny-come-latelys. All of a sudden now uh, you've been keeping the law and all of a sudden people like these Gentiles can just come to faith and they can come to Christ and they don't have to go through all the hoops that you go through with the law. It, it, it didn't sit right with these people. It didn't sit right with a lot of people, and so the Bible tells us that certain of these Pharisees were so passionate about it that they traveled uh, from Jerusalem down to Antioch, about 250 miles, uh, to, to upset the brethren, to try to correct them where they thought the church... Now, now, now please understand, just as a parenthesis here, the, the church at Antioch, it's going well. It's going well there. The, the, the headquarters of Christianity has moved from Jerusalem to Antioch. There's been that mission trip that lasted, that first trip of Paul and Barnabas that lasted about two years. They've just got back to where people are being saved and, and baptized, and, and, and the church is becoming more Gentile, and, and, and things are going well there. And whenever things are going well in a church, you'll find Satan trying to disrupt that. You'll find all of a sudden people get upset at petty stuff and leave. You'll find people disagreeing with each other over petty things when, when things are going well. So here comes these, these guys, and they, they're trying to deliver this message, and they're trying to teach heresy to the church at Antioch. Imagine what that would be like if, if someone stood up in a service and tried to teach heresy. We can imagine just a little bit what that was, might have been like last week. Someone trying to stand up and say, uh, uh, um, church at Antioch. We've come, we've come from uh, Judea, we've come, we've traveled a long way, and uh, look, you people here, you think you're saved. You think you are right with God, and, uh, and I know you mean well, but you are not right with God. And in fact, listen to me, church, you won't be right with God until you strictly follow all the laws that we as Jewish people have followed all these generations. 
and until you are circumcised. So please, after the service, please feel free to visit the outpatient surgical tent uh, right out there and just have a small procedure done. And after that, uh, then you can be right with God and then you can be saved like we are. Your, your, your faith isn't enough. Your simple faith, by grace, that's not enough. You must add to it respect for and obedience to the law of Moses. The Bible says this, um, I love King James lingo. It says this caused no small dispute and di uh, disagreement and disputation. That means someone was losing a head. Someone named Paul or Barnabas or maybe Peter was like, ho, 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 no, 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 uh, that is not what we're doing here. We're not going backwards. We're not, we're going forward. That's not how people are saved today. And so it, it, it's, maybe it's still hard for you to understand how serious a problem this was. Satan had a strategy to hold up the progress of the early church. This is a danger point. This is a danger point in this simple gospel. Satan would, would have loved 2,000 years ago and still would love today and still has many deceived today. But Satan would have loved 2,000 years ago to establish a works-based righteousness in the early church. And if he had, the simple grace gospel would have disappeared. The simple grace gospel would have gone away. And so the, 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 the default mode of us as human beings is we want to earn our salvation. And people were latching on to this. And Satan would love, Satan has always loved to get Christians fighting with each other over theological issues like this, or even minor non-theological issues, preferential issues. Satan loves that. Because the church is taking a new look. The church is taking on a Gentile look. More and more Gentiles, I'm back in Acts 15, I'm not talking about this church, though churches always take a different look. There's always new people. Always new faces, always, always families coming in, always new opportunities to reach people with the gospel. And it's always been that way. The church has taken on a new look. And my, my friends, my church family, it's so important that we follow the wave of the Holy Spirit, that we yield to what God is doing, that we allow him to work and we're sensitive to that. So these Jews were no longer majority stockholders in the church. It was becoming a Gentile church. The focus of ministry had swung away from Jerusalem and now centered on Antioch, where Paul, Paul serves at Antioch as more or less the pastor of missions. Some Jews were struggling with this change, and they're about to lock horns. They didn't like the fact that these Gentiles were able to retain their own identity and still become Christians. In other words, just to be clear on this, and we'll move on, but they thought that a Gentile needed to become a Jew. They needed to become a Jew. They needed to keep the law. They needed to, to have the act of circumcision done. In, in effect, they were saying, you can't become a Christian in full right standing with God unless you get circumcised and keep all the law. And you, you might think, this, this sounds easy to spot, Pastor. This sounds like a ridiculous heresy that they would have had no trouble. You, you might be asking, were people really getting caught up in this? Yes, they were. In fact, a companion passage to this is Galatians chapter 2. You don't have to turn there. I'll reference it one more time later in the message. But in Galatians chapter 2 tells us that this was dividing the church. The Jews and the Gentiles were sitting on opposite sides of the sanctuary. I think the Bible says the softball team had to disband because the pitcher was a Jew and the catcher was a Gentile and they, wouldn't, they refused to touch the same softball. I mean, it was getting bad. They had to cancel all the potlucks. And so this was a very serious issue. So we're not talking about some kind of disagreement over the wallpaper in the ladies' room or anything like that. This is a division over the definition and nature of salvation by grace through faith alone. Whether or not these two groups of believers in the early church could get along in fellowship and agree on what the Bible says. What does the Bible say? So the Bible tells us in Acts 15 2, we're talking here, number one, about the allegations. Those are the allegations. And we're told that Paul and Barnabas in verse 2 were sent from Antioch down south back up to Jerusalem, 250 miles away. 
this caravan from the church went to meet with apostles and elders and church leaders. And along the way, they made some pit stops to say, hey, the Lord's working. The Lord's saving Gentiles. The Lord's working in Jewish people's hearts. And the Lord's forging us into one body called the church. And he stopped another church and gave a report in another church. And they finally get to Jerusalem. And number two, here's the assessment. Number two, the assessment. We spent a great deal of time just now talking about how serious this was and how crucial and what, what a watershed moment this was for the church. And so because of how serious this is, a conference was called. They called a business meeting. Oh, no. They called a conference to address this situation. Verse 6 says, I love it, and tucked away in the Greek is a little bit of an important meeting. It says, verse 6 says, they came together to look into this matter. And, and underneath the surface of our English language in the Greek, it literally means they specifically gathered to look into the word. By the way, my friends, that's why we've gathered here today. Hope you're not here to see me or hear me or hear what I have to say because I have weird opinions and silly jokes. We are here to look into the word of God. We are here to carefully and, and, and very meticulously talk about the Word of God. And they, they got together. They want to know, what does the Bible say? What, what is the sola scriptura on this matter? They want to see what God's Word theologically taught about grace. I'm still painting my picture for you, but at some point in this debate, after it got really heated, Peter stands up. Boy, you didn't expect Peter to stand up. Peter stands up in the midst of this and says, excuse me, can I say a few words? Can I have the floor? And Peter ends up giving the doctrinal consensus of the early church. Um, it, in fact, verse, uh, I, I drew attention to it when we read the Bible, but it is verse 11. Uh, can we read it again? But we believe, verse 11, that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved even as they and um, that's a doctrinal statement. That was one of the very first doctrinal statements of the early church. If this moment where Peter stands up hadn't happened, the grace of God's gospel would have been lost forever. But what's fascinating is that there was a point in Peter's life when he was backward on this issue as well. You ever been backward on an issue? You ever swore you were right but realized later you were wrong? And there was a point, Galatians 2 rehearses this as well, and if you're really into this, and this is going to be like graduate level for some of you here today, if you wonder, well, is, it, is Galatians 2, Galatians 2 is where Paul stood up to Peter and confronted him about this hypocrisy, about this issue that we're talking about in Acts 15. You wonder, was well, Acts 15 and Galatians 2 talking about the same event? They are not, I believe, the same event. Galatians 2 is a very private matter between Paul and Peter. Gal uh, Acts 15 is a very public issue, a public defense of the gospel that is affecting the whole church. Well, in, uh, in Galatians chapter 2, uh, Peter was backwards on this issue. Peter was, was uh, eating all the meats he could with the Gentiles, but when he got with the Jews, he was not eating all the, 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 um, the pork and all the, the meats that were, were disallowed for him to eat as a Jewish person. He was being hypocritical. And Paul, the Bible says that Paul grabbed him by the shirt collar, and, and uh, in front of them all, he said, Peter, you're wrong. And hundreds of years from now, there'll be millions of people who think you are as infallible as the Pope. And I'm telling you, Peter, you are wrong on this matter. You are acting one way with the Gentiles and another way with the Jews. And, and Peter, have you forgotten that we are not saved by keeping the works of the law? We are saved by grace through faith alone. Now, from what we understand, that public or that private rebuke of Peter in Galatians 2 uh, resulted in Peter acknowledging his error. And by the time we get to Acts chapter 15, it is Peter now who becomes the chief spokesperson. It's not Paul. The emphasis here is given to Peter as he tries to correct the theology of the church. Now, I'm going to need, uh, I need some help. Nelson, will you come up here and, and stand right here? And uh, uh, Tim, will you come up here and stand right here? I need you guys. All these... Uh, Wonderful men. Just you guys stand. I'm going to stay up here. Okay? So we're going to talk about, Peter's going to, going to use a Jew. You just face the audience. All right? This is Nelson and this is Tim. These are friends of mine. At least they are until this moment. 
Um, which one of you would like to represent the Jewish people? God's people, right here, God's people. Nelson, you are a carnal, unwashed heathen. <laughs> All right. So Tim's going to be uh, represent the, the, the Jewish, the, the Pharisees, and, and, and Nelson's going to represent the, the, the Gentile believers who are coming to Christ. And so, so Peter's going to give three illustrations, going to give three tests, and he's going to make three points in favor of the simple gospel. He's going to give three points in favor of the Jewish people uh, accepting the Gentiles. All right? You'll be on the screen in your notes. Here you go if you want to take notes. The first test is what we call the spirit test. It's the spirit test. And so Peter recounts what happened with him and Cornelius in Acts chapter 10. Several years prior to this, God's done a great work in Peter's heart, where Peter realized back then that, my goodness, God gave the Holy Spirit to the Jewish people, and then right there in Acts 10 with the household of Cornelius and how God brought revival to the Gentiles, that God, brought, God gave the Spirit to the Gentiles as well. And, and so, so Peter looks across this, this council, this debate, this disagreement, and he says, do you not understand that I was there when God used me to see the Holy Spirit fall on the Gentiles? And he says, men and brethren, we have the Holy Spirit, and they have the Holy Spirit. And who are we to disagree with what God has chosen? Who are we to disagree with what God has done? And let's park right here for a second. Let me tell you, I, don't, I think you guys are getting along. You guys getting along okay? Okay. You weren't too, I mean, yes, are you got something against him? Not anymore. Not anymore. Good. So, so if, if Tim has the spirit and, and, and Nelson has the spirit, there ain't any reason why two people that have the spirit, the Holy Spirit in their lives can't get along. If they're, if they're spirit filled, they're spirit indwelt. If they're spirit filled and spirit led and spirit guided, if they're allowing the spirit to speak to them the truth of scripture and lead them to Christ, there is no reason why he should look down on him or he should look down on him because they both have the spirit. And the spirit's working differently in the Jewish people and the spirit's working differently in the Gentile people. The spirit works different in this person's life and it does in that person's life. The second test. The second test that Peter mentions is the salvation test. This is all right here in the Bible. Uh, this is from verse number 9. Uh, verse number uh, 8 was the, the spirit test. Verse number 9, we call this the salvation test. You guys are doing good. I know I'm just kind of leaving you here. The salvation test. Peter draws attention to the mode of salvation, to the method of salvation. And he says, hey, Jewish people, it's different for us now. Sure, God used the law and the symbol of circumcision and all the Old Testament prophets to point to the fact that one day our Messiah was coming. And we put faith and trust in that Messiah, and now we are saved by faith. And, and, and brethren, my Jewish friends, listen, that's the same way that Nelson is saved. You're now saved. You recognize you're now, you're now saved by faith. And, and Abraham's given as, as an example in all these different passages like, and, and he's saved by faith. This is the salvation. Well, how are we saved? Well, as a Jewish person, they have to realize, uh, yeah, things, th this, is a, this is a different era now. This is a different mode. Now, now, now we used to be saved by looking forward to the cross. Now we get saved by putting faith backwards in the cross. And this is all different now. Now, for us today, kind of bring this up to 2024, you don't know what God's doing in every person's life. It, it, Tim could be a religious sinner. Uh, Nelson could be a Gentile, carnal, very fleshly, worldly sinner. But it's the same faith that saves them. There, there, there's no difference between Jew and Greek. There's no difference in the way they're saved. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. There's one more test that Paul uh, Peter mentions here, rather. I say Paul because Peter sounds a lot like Paul in verse uh, number uh, 10. Can I read it? And then I'll explain it. Verse 10 says, Now therefore, why tempt ye God to put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? The law was like a burden that even the Jews couldn't keep. They couldn't keep all 613 laws. And so, I love this. 
and, and, and it's a school, I give, give you, it's the schoolmaster test. Did I tell you? I don't think I told you. It's the schoolmaster test. You got the spirit test, the salvation test, the schoolmaster test. And so Peter sounds a lot like Paul here, because Paul's the one that kind of introduced that idea that the law was our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. The law was just like the mirror that showed us how unholy we were in the face of a holy God. And so Peter looks at the Jews and says, um, you know, the, the, the law, the purpose of law served. Do you keep the law? And so if, if I'm Peter and you're the average Pharisee, you're the average, you know, uh, a Jew, and I say, have you kept the law perfectly? You would have to say what, Tim? No. So why are you putting pressure on him? You, you understand? Look up this way. You understand? So why are you looking down on him? If you haven't kept the law, uh, if you ain't perfect, why do you expect him to be perfect? Recognize the law was just operating to bring you to Christ. The, the, the law could never save you. The law simply showed you your inability to save yourself and showed you your need of a savior. Thank you, gentlemen. You may have a seat. Appreciate your help today. Paul wrote that the law was only a teacher to show us our need for Christ. For example, on the Sabbath day, we know from uh, Jewish law, you could not even carry a chair from one room to another on the Sabbath, because then you would be guilty of bearing a burden, of carrying a burden, and that would be considered work, and you weren't allowed to work on the Sabbath. A, uh, a, a woman could not look into a mirror on the Sabbath day, lest she be tempted to pluck an eyebrow, which would be considered work. On the Sabbath, you could not lift a spoon weighing more than one fig. I don't know how much a fig weighs. I know how much a fig Newton weighs. I love fig Newtons. I don't know what a fig even looks like. You could not lift a spoon weighing more than a fig and, be, and bring that to your mouth without being considered bearing a burden on the Sabbath. They even debated such ridiculous things at long length about whether a man wearing a false leg or a false tooth would be guilty of bearing a burden. I don't even know they had such things back then. The 613 commandments of the law itself were more of a load than a man could carry. And so the law was the schoolmaster to point to mankind's need of a redeemer in Jesus Christ. It, it revealed our need for a sinless Savior who kept all the law perfectly who, who bore the penalty of our guilt before a holy God. And Peter is saying, no Jew ever kept the law, so why are you imposing that on the Gentiles? Which brings us to our third point this morning, our final point, and it leaves us a little bit on a cliffhanger before we cover the rest of the chapter, Lord willing, next Sunday. It's number three, the agreement. The agreement. The first church council is going to come to a close after Peter gives his convincing three-point argument. The Bible tells us just by way of commentary that after Peter sat down that Barnabas and Paul stood up and testified about the miracles and wonders that God had wrought among the Gentiles. And then they sat down and then James stands up and declares what's on his mind. Praise the Lord that this conflict was handled graciously and it was resolved scripturally and that God's word had the answers. You can almost hear the battle cry of the Reformation, sola scriptura, coming from Peter and James's mouths. Sadly, for some reason, there are still people today who struggle to accept salvation by grace through faith alone. It might not seem fair, <laughs> and praise God it isn't fair. We don't get the hell that we deserve because we, by, by a very simple act of the will, believe and trust in what Jesus has done for us. Many today... I hope nobody here, but perhaps, listen to me, many today believe that somehow they save themselves and Jesus helps them do it. 
That's the perspective you have a lot of times. People have, especially those that come from very religious backgrounds. Well, I, I, I save myself, and, and then Jesus sprinkles in, you know, his part. So many religions today adhere to a Jesus plus something gospel. Jesus plus baptism. Jesus plus catechism. Jesus uh, plus confirmation. Jesus plus church attendance. Jesus plus keeping the law. Jesus plus giving the tithe. Jesus plus going to mass. But if we add anything to the gospel, we lose the gospel. It is Jesus plus nothing. It is the grace gospel. Gospel math works like this. Jesus plus nothing equals everything. That's the gospel. The, it, you come to Jesus alone. And the scriptures alone, the authority, the infallible authority on this say, you come to Jesus alone, by faith alone, to be saved from your sins. This will always be disputed. This simple truth has fallen on such hard times in 2024. This will always be debated because man always in his pride wants to earn God's favor. You can't earn God's favor. Your work will never work. Your good works will never be good enough. And yet I, I don't want to take the charity. I don't want to take the gift. I want to earn it myself. You have to swallow your pride and humble yourself before God. Admit you're a sinner and believe that what Jesus Christ did on the cross is your only hope, your only plan of salvation. Praise God. Last Wednesday after church, some parents brought their little boy to me, little 11-year-old boy to me. Went back here Wednesday night. You should be at church on Wednesday nights. People get saved. Came back into this room over here, and I went through Romans Road. Went through Romans 3.10, Romans 3.23. All have sinned, come short of the glory of God. There is none righteous, no, not one. God has a standard, and we don't reach that standard. I said Romans 5.8 says, but God demonstrated his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And how amazing that is that God actually showed us by giving. God, God, uh, love is an action verb. And God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And that Christ died for us, that Christ took our place. He was our substitute. Because the Bible says the wages, Romans 6, 23, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. You all know what a wage is. It's what you earn. It's your paycheck. What you earn because of your sin. Because what you earn because of your sin is death, death in hell. Death, separation from God. But the gift of God is eternal life. And I asked this young man, I said, oh, what do you have to do? If I want to give you this Bible as a gift, what do you have to do? And he kind of looked at it because it's not a trick question, but he thought it was. And Hey, I'm giving you my Bible. What do you have to do? It's actually my phone. I was trying to give him my phone. It was hypothetical. He says, reach out and take it. I said, that's right. What if I said, I want to give you this as a free gift, but you've got to drop and give me 20 push-ups? I want to give you this as a free gift, just I, I need your firstborn son when he's born. Not a gift. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So, so first, you admit you're a sinner. Secondly, you, you believe that Jesus Christ took your place. And third, you call upon his name. Romans 10, uh, uh, 9 and 10 says, If thou wilt confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that God has raised Jesus from the dead, you'll be saved. And, and verse uh, 10 kind of repeats verse 9 in a different order. It says, If you'll believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, you'll be saved. And Romans 10, 13 says, whosoever, everybody here is a whosoever. Everybody here is a anybody. You're a whosoever. Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved, whether you're Jew or Gentile or black or white or rich or poor or smart or uneducated or whatever side of the tracks you live on. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Do so you understand when you go back there to Acts 15 and verse number 1, where, where it says in Acts 15, 1, the end of verse says, these, these men were teaching this heresy that said, except ye be circumcised after the manner of Moses, you cannot be saved. 
please don't miss this. It's so important. I'll be very emphatic. You cannot fill in the blank before that phrase or fill in the blank after that phrase. You cannot be saved and make it true any way you cut it. There is nobody you could ever look at and say, you cannot be saved. You got to do this. If you don't do that, you cannot be saved. You cannot be saved unless you fill in the blank. There, that is not true. That is heresy. Everybody in this room, everybody in this world can be saved the same way everyone is saved. Through Jesus alone. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. No one has ever been saved by good works or human performances of righteousness. So that's why that phrase, you cannot be saved, should never be spoken to anyone. It can never truthfully be spoken to anyone. And this was the topic of the First Reformation. This is what the First Reformation was about. What does the Bible say? Are you in the Word? I'm happy you're here today. I'm happy you're saved and got baptized years ago. I'm happy that you're a, a faithful member of this church. Are you in the Word? When you face dilemmas and decisions and you face confusing things in this culture, what does the Bible say? Sola Scriptura is the answer every time. What does the Bible say? When I find out what the Bible says, I obey it, and that's good enough for me. And God blesses as we keep his word. Maybe there need to be a first reformation in your life, personally, of simple adherence to the simple truths of Scripture. The gospel is worth fighting for. Let's pray. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed today. Would you stand to your feet? As we have our invitation this morning. <clears throat> Man, I hope you're fired up about the gospel, about the truth of it. <clears throat> when's the last time, when's the last time the, the simple truth, the glorious truth of the gospel were just fresh on your lips, were just, were just bursting out of you? You, you were so excited to share with, with waiters and waitresses and cashiers and neighbors and, and coworkers and everybody you can talk to. You're so excited to tell them about church and about the Word of God and about what God's teaching you. When's the, when's the last time you were so bold to share that Jesus will save you? Jesus saved me. Tell your story. Give your testimony. Share what God's done in your life. They can't deny that. Tell them how you got saved. Tell them what God's doing in you and in your family. It's easy to sit in our little council meeting here this morning and say amen to the truths of the simple gospel, but we've got to get that message out there, don't we? We have to be more bold and aggressive. We have to be more loving and, and faithful, and we have to be sharing this gospel message. It's for everyone. Do you believe that, church? If you believe that, say amen. It's for everyone. If God has spoken to you about that. Is there a soul? Is there a couple people on your, on your mind, on your heart? that you need to share the gospel with this week. Give them a track, send them a text, send them an email, schedule an appointment, take them to coffee, take them to a restaurant, go to their house, invite them to your house. Is there a person you need to pray for, you need to commit to sharing the gospel with? Who's your one? Number two, and I'm going to start the invitation. Number two, the gospel was clearly explained today. Maybe you're here today and you needed it. Maybe you needed to be confronted with the truth that it's not your heritage that saves you. It's not your family name that saves you. It's not your good works that earn you a spot in heaven. You and I are saved the same way people have been saved since the cross, and that is by trusting in the shed blood and death sacrifice and rising again of Jesus Christ in complete victory over sin, death, and hell. And if you know you're a sinner, you confess your sins, and you believe that Jesus Christ is the only way to go to heaven, and you call upon him to save you, and he saves you because you are a whosoever, and whosoever can be saved. Would you like to do that right now? Church family, you're praying. Folks, if you're here today and you're not sure you're a Christian, would you listen to me? Would you simply, from your heart to God's heart, would you simply sincerely pray something like this? You can repeat after me in, 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 your, in your head, in your heart. You can say it out loud. It doesn't matter to me. 
Would you pray this prayer to God? Say, dear, dear Father, I know that I'm a sinner. I know that my sin is sending me to hell. Please forgive me of my sin. Thank you that Jesus died on the cross and paid the price for my sins that I could never pay. I now trust in Jesus as my only hope of salvation. Please come into my heart and make me a real believer. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, if you prayed that prayer, our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. If you just prayed that prayer, I'm not going to embarrass you. I just want to rejoice with you. If you just prayed that prayer here today to be saved, would you just quietly, quickly slip your hand up? I just prayed that prayer to be saved. God bless you. I see that hand. Amen. We don't always do it out loud like that. We don't always do it the same procedure, but I'm glad I did today. Thank you so much for raising your hand, and God bless you for praying that prayer. So if you did it, you're not alone. Someone else did it too. Anybody else? Pastor, I did that prayer. I prayed that prayer a moment ago. I understood, and I did it. Well, we, re we rejoice with whoever there is rejoicing in heaven over the salvation of a soul. Would you pray with me? And let's have our invitation time. Instruments will play in a moment, and you can move and do what God has called you to do. Father, thank you for your goodness in our lives. Thank you for the gospel. I pray that we would proclaim it today and this week. We'd be faithful at that. You'll, you'd, you'd help us to draw some battle lines in our, in our minds and in, in our uh, sharing of the gospel about how simple it is. Help us to be clear. Help us to be uh, loving as we share it with people. We can see people saved. Thank you for the boldness of these apostles to stand up for what the scriptures say. Help Calvary. Help me as pastor. Help every one of our church members to always lean strong on what does the Bible say. We pray this in Jesus' name. The piano is going to play a few verses of a song.